Well, Canada Post has been having quite a time, and we have been thinking lately that they get this year's first award for poor public relations, and that poor public relations has at its very bottom the super box. And I think that Ted Rutledge has a few words to say that f about that. And we'll be back again. We're going to be talking to Hugh Clark, Canada Poster Masters and Assistants Association, and uh, to Mr. Mazzaro. And uh, later on, of course, we have Jim Stark here. So we're, first of all, the post office, and now Ted Rutledge. If you're one of the many Canadians who don't receive home delivery of your mail, you probably recognize these things here. According to Canada Post, they're dinosaurs, and they're on their way out. This is a new breed of mailbox, and it's part of a two-year plan by Canada Post. Last year, the federal government told the post office to clean up its debts and start turning a profit in two years. To cut losses, the post office won't provide home delivery to some 100,000 new addresses each year. They'll be served by the new super boxes. They'll also replace a full one-third of the rural post offices in Canada. Canada Post says without these measures, the price of sending a letter would have to rise to 50 cents, just to break even. And with barely 15 months left, Canada Post is not likely to change its plans. And more than a few taxpayers are furious. After Fred Macero built his house in Deep Cove, he was told his property had been selected as a new site for the neighborhood post box. No warning, no debate, and no compensation. So he's parked his truck over the spot and is willing to fight the decision all the way. And welcome to Webster. Fred Mazzaro, we're glad to see you here today. What happened? Early one morning, did you get a super box? Uh, no, we haven't got the super box as yet. About quarter after seven in the morning, uh, my wife was uh, wakened by some pounding on the door, and the uh, gentleman at the door asked her to move the truck because the backhoe was here. And my wife thought it was some work that was going to be done across the street as it's a new subdivision. She moved the truck, and then they immediately went to work to remove some gravel, which I was using for cement work in, in front of the house. She asked them who they were and what they were doing, and they said they were the post office, and that's where the new post box was going to go. And what was the result? I understand you just plain got mad. Yeah, I got very angry, and uh, first, not quite, at, not at the moment. Um, she phoned me up and told me, and we phoned the post office and asked them why it was selected and could there be another place selected and, and, and why it wasn't put on the corner where the original box was. Um, they came back uh, at the end of the day and told me that is the only place that it could be put placed in our subdivision and that's when I got angry and I said a few things that I wouldn't say to a lady. But well, you're not necessarily <laughs> talking to a lady here, you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we'll come back to you in a moment. Mm. I'd like to introduce you to Hugh Clark from the Canadian Postmasters and Assistants Association. That's a union, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's the uh, it's a union that entails all of the employees in rural Canada, whether they're assistants or whether they're postmasters. It's you're a based in Ottawa. I'm based in Ottawa. It's a unique union. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about Canada Post's choices to reduce its debt at the cost of rural Canada? Well, I think it's ridiculous, and uh, I think if more people got just as mad as this gentleman, they'd stop it. I, when you uh, uh, want a manager whose only job is to raise the price of stamps and lower the levels of service. You don't have to pay them the kind of money we're paying these people. You can get a kid off the street for five bucks an hour to do that. But there are 5,200 rural post offices in this country and 5,000 rural mailboxes, and they plan that 3,500 of the largest of these would go to private contractors. And then, as I understand it, the minister, Michel Cote, changed his mind in the middle of December, and uh, he said that now they'll have 90 days consultation. Does that make you uh, feel more happy about the situation? Well, knowing the way that Canada Post consults, <laughs> it doesn't do anything at all for my spirits because these people don't consult. What they do is they go in and they say, these are your choices, and this man will probably support me on that. You take them or leave them. And uh, the people in British Columbia want to know how much they consult. They should talk to the people in Ruskin, British Columbia, a town of 600 people who had 30 days and gone. And uh, the Canada Post was even upset when these people had the audacity to have, them t tell, have the management tell them, why are we losing our post office? But Mr. Clark, you know, the finance minister said to Canada Post they had two years to get out of debt. They had to do that. And uh, Donald Lad Ladner, the Post, uh, Canada Post president, is trying hard to follow those orders. He's been reducing home deliveries, cutting down the number of mailboxes, increasing postal rates, closing down the, uh, these rural post offices and increasing franchising to private sector and doing all the things that he must do to cut these. Uh, so what's the answer? Is the answer political? <coughs> Well, yeah, I think the answer is for Michael Wilson and Brian Mulroney to leave the rural mail for two years, 
make an election issue and see if they can get back on it. Well, I heard you the other day, Fred Mazzaro, and you were ready to make an election issue. How do you feel about it now that you've had time to think it over a bit? Oh, I still feel exactly the same way. I'm getting no um, cooperation in terms of uh, consideration of other alternatives. And um, I'm finding more and more about the service that, that it's, it's random, it's haphazard. Some subdivisions, um, one end of the subdivision will have no mail service, while the other end of the subdivision will have the green boxes. Other subdivisions of about the same age have door-to-door -door services, and ours, in our case, we had the green boxes, and now we're going to have the beautiful super box. But we can't have it both ways, can we? After all, they do have to get down the deficit that they have. There were 184 million in the blue, in the red one. Uh, I always say blue. That story, uh, mm -hmm. one year, and uh, 340 the next, and they're anticipating now uh, 30 million. Uh, deficit this year and then breaking even the next year. To do that, they have to cut services. Is there any other way? Well, I think there are other ways. Um, one of the ways that they could do it in the new subdivisions, and I, as I see, we're not only fighting for just the new subdivisions. I think it's a progression that's eventually going to get into all subdivisions. But in the new subdivisions, they don't necessarily have to give us mail service every day. Give us door-to-door -door service every second day. Most of the people I talk to are more than happy to have that. If it's going to put some of the mailmen out of work, in terms of delivery, um, maybe they could be taken up in terms of the area where sorting seems to be a problem. Uh, we seem to have a bit of a problem in terms of getting mail in a short period of time from one place to another. We could shorten the time, I think, if we just added uh, more individual sorting and, and handling the mail. Well, you live in Deep Cove, and there was an arbitrary decision made that there should not be any mail delivery to your new home. Where does the mail delivery end? Good question. It's, it's arbitrary. It, they say it's ar not arbitrary. In fact, I understand the decision originally to not give new subdivisions uh, mail was supposedly made in 1974, 12 years ago. And I have yet to find anybody who's built a or have a subdivision in the, built in the 70s that did not get door-to-door -door service. It just seems that they decided to chop on the summer of 85 and those people that, that had no distinct service or no door-to-door -door service then, from then on weren't going to get But in. you have the green rural uh, boxes about two blocks away. Were you ever promised door-to-door -door delivery? Me personally, no, but the individual, the first lady on the street, she had no mail service. She went, she used to have to go okay. to the mail, uh, the post office, pick up her mail and then come home. She, um, she asked one at one time when she was picking up mail, when could she expect uh, mail service? And they told her that once the subdivision was completed, then we could, she could expect door-to-door -door service. Well, it seems rather ironic that there is this boundary somewhere or other that is set by some rules we know not, by which no one will further get service. And uh, I guess the postmasters have some feelings on that too. Oh, we have some serious feelings on it because basically I don't think service has anything to do with what uh, the corporation and the conservative government are doing. I think what they're doing is if you read the book, it says these people will be privatized and these, uh, these people who are working for the post office will now be hired by these people and they can be paid four fifty an hour and they will lose their superannuation and they will lose all those benefits of these. And I find this, I find this to be uh, repulsive that a government would, would, would cooperate with the Canada Post to do this. Well, and that's what they're trying to do. What they're saying is that, they, that, the, that the employees in rural Canada do not have the rights of employees anywhere else, and we're telling you that right now. Do you think it's a vendetta against rural Canada? I think it's a straight vendetta against rural Canada because they don't have the guts to take on urban Canada. The small towns can't that's fight right. back. That's correct. That's exactly what I think. Well, what about the... Oh, let me see. Ladner promised, didn't he, that there would be no privatization before 1990. Is no. the privatization coming ahead now? No. The, what happened was the Marshman committee, which was a committee sent up by the Conservative government, studied the post office across the country, and they make a statement on page 20 of the Marshman report that says, privatization should not be considered until 1990, and then it should be reconsidered. But they're going ahead with it now. They're franchising well, small areas. What they're doing is they're only taking out of the Marshman report, uh, committee report that thing that makes the government and the Canada Post Corporation happy. Fred, don't you really think that super boxes are, after all, quite efficient? I think they're useful in areas that have no mail or in areas that, that uh, would have to go a great deal of distance in order to get their mail. And if that cut down the mail, it would be um, increasing the efficiency. But to me, in, in my area, where a small area would take 20 minutes to deliver the mail, and since I pay 36 cents 
a, a stamp or 40 no. or whatever it's going to go to. I would like the same mail service as a guy two doors away from what me. What did the District of North Vancouver say to you? The District of North Vancouver on the 28th of July uh, endorsed the placing of the mailboxes. Um, I went to the district after I had settled down and uh, <laughs> got your blood pressure back yes, in shape. And applied to the district to make a presentation before them. At, when I stated my case to them, they then wanted Canada Post to come forth with the concerns that I had expressed and as well wanted a survey from their traffic committee. And um, the survey from the traffic committee suggested that if there was to be a box, it should not be placed in front of my place, but another place so as to, cu so as to cut down congestion. Canada Post did not show up for the meeting. Ah, your calls to Fred Mazzaro and Hugh Clark after the break. Super Mailbox lets you post your mail. That's one. It lets you pick up your mail. That's two. It even lets you pick up your parcels. But how do we know this new community mailbox service is a super idea? And welcome back. <coughs> you know, uh, Hugh, this was the one issue, wasn't it, that brought the backbenchers of the Tory party into revolt? Yes, it was. Is it possible to do it again? I think it's possible to do it again, Iona, and I think there's something I should have mentioned earlier. There's a new organization being formed across Canada, and it's called uh, Rural Dignity. And what it's doing is we're get, trying to get all of the rural communities together and the mayors and the councils, and we're going to make a, a semi-political force out of this because we're going to tell the government and the Canada Post that we're not about to be pushed around anymore. You know, that uh, we're Canadians. A lot of us guys fought in the Second World War, and we deserve the same rights and the same dignity. In fact, we're having a meeting in Agassiz on January the 31st at 3 o'clock, and we would welcome support from the, the people who, need, uh, who are sick and fed well, up with rural violence. let's see what the callers have to say. Uh, You're on the air to Hugh no, Clark I and Fred Mazzaro. Go ahead, please. Yes. I'm, firstly, I just, I'm just really, really uh, up in the air about why people think the post office is such a sacred cow and mail delivery is such a sacred thing and they have to have it every day at their house. Firstly, the I, I only thing I really can sympathize with is this man having this box in front of his yard. There's really no use for that or, or need. But I think we should have three days a week service and we have to pick it up in a box somewhere. Save money. I'm getting sick and tired of paying increased rates. I'm getting sick and tired of my taxes going up and hearing about the national debt. I, I don't want. I, I don't want to have to uh, have to pay more increased costs. So these uh, things they're doing are a good way to get their price down. Thank you, caller. What do you want out of them, uh, Fred Mazzaro? What do you want them to do? Oh, firstly, I want them to take the box out of the. But say they don't take the box out. What are you going to do? Then I will be forced to uh, to take them to court and to su file suit for the uh, the loss in uh, uh, value of my property. But it's because they didn't give you notice and because that when you built your, your property there, you didn't know that was going to happen. That's true. And that seems that's the way it is all over the place. If Canada Post has been planning this thing for 12 years, as, as one individual said, it started in 1974, then they should have had the foresight to designate areas ahead of time and put them in. If we have to have the box... Well, if there were designated mm -hmm. areas, would you side with this caller who is saying, you know, three days a week is good enough, super boxes are okay? Actually, um, the people that I talked to would, w could see cutting the cost of residential delivery in half by accepting t uh, two days a week, and they'd be more than happy with it. Well, the price goes down considerably, I think, doesn't it, from $113 a year to $28 a year by using this. Well, thank you, caller. We're going to move along. And you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Iona. Hello. Uh, I don't know why these fellows at the post office seem to find it such a deep, dark mystery to try and figure out how to, how to uh, stop, uh, reduce the deficit. They could reduce the deficit overnight simply by stopping to deliver junk mail and deliver the proper mail. Well, let's ask the postmaster no. president here, Hugh Clark. How do you feel about that? Well, I... <laughs> I know that people are upset about uh, what, the, what he's calling junk mail, but you have to remember the junk mail uh, supplies the post office with a good amount of their revenue, and uh, so I don't think that the delivering of junk mail is, uh, although a lot of us don't like to see it in our box, I think it's part of the way of carrying the deficit. And I said, well, I think without the junk mail, you may find the price of first class mail would be a lot higher. Well, we doubled our price here a few years ago, and we didn't seem to get rid of the deficit. The problem that I see it is, We've got mailmen running around with bags and bags and bags full of junk mail, and if they were, didn't have these bags full of junk mail, they could deliver the proper mail. Well, is mail going to become obsolete in time? Are we all going to be electronically talking to each other? I guess there'll still be room for the odd oh, junk mail. You'll always well, have what is known as a mother and daughter. Moving long distance, you're on the air from Vernon. 
Yes, uh, firstly, I'd, I have to sympathize with the fellow that's going to end up with the box or possibly end up with the box in front of his property. But having been uh, both sides of the street, originally with the old green boxes, having uh, service door to door now, and I would gladly go back to a common box. To me, it seems absolutely ludicrous that we have a, ma a mailman with a van in the particular subdivision I live in, it requires, I'm at the end of a half a mile long street. He drives down every two or three doors, gets out of his truck, drives in, delivers two or three letters, and an awful lot of junk mail. And to me, that is really great me. If it is that much of a profit in the junk mail, let's double it and really see if it's still worthwhile. Well, but to come back to it, he'll drive to the end of our street, go up to the next one, and the whole subdivision could be so simply served by one common super box, as it's called. And to me, it would be a, a, a tremendous step in the right direction. Thank you, caller. Fred Mazzaro? Um, I think this, this caller hasn't been looking at the numbers properly. Um, in terms of complaining about the, the um, postman, he's going to have to drive up the street anyway. And in terms of the, the numbers that Canada Post uses, these boxes will be no more than 1,200 feet apart. So he, in a half a mile, he's going to have to drive the whole length, the whole length anyway. Well, nice go ahead. I think there's something else they should realize about the super boxes, that those little parcel containers will only hold so many parcels. So if you have more parcels than the container will hold, whose parcels get put in the box, and who gets the key, and what happens to the security of mail? I, I think there's a whole issue here that has to be solved and answered. Fred? And the other thing that this, this gentleman, who sounds fairly young and fairly healthy, doesn't recognize mm. is these boxes are going to be put up, and senior citizens are also mm. going to have to go. And if you look at the weather of Canada, three to four months of the year, ice, snow, and rain. And these individuals are going to have to negotiate that weather to get their, their uh, mail. And I don't okay. really think that's More fair. More callers. You're on the air. Hi. How are you today? Pretty good. Good. I have a, a little complaint here. We have the green box in our area now. And like the person was saying, if you're handicapped or senior citizens, they can't bend down or pick up the mail. And also, if we have the green or the new machine or new post boxes in, Maybe if they have a little uh, cul-de-sac where people can drive in and get them off the roads and everything instead of holding up people's yards and, and mail flying all over the place would be fine. Thank you. This is one of Fred's points that there should be more planning on the way they're put together. Thank you for your call. Long distance going up to Summerland. You're on the air. Hello. Uh, I live in Summerland and there's about 30 families out here and we have to go 10 miles to pick up our mail. It's a 20 mile round trip. And so uh, she thinks you're probably pretty well off. You just have to walk. Certainly do. I'd love to have a mailbox at the door. And that's the beautiful part of this. This is, this is where I think Canada Post got their statistics. This poor lady's got to go 30 miles to get her mail. She would like to have the box. And so they can put the box in there and they can say 100% of the people who have the box are happy with them. But in my subdivision where the guy next door gets door-to-door -door service, I've got 100% of the people that are totally opposed to the box. Thanks for your call. Well, you're on the cutting edge of change. And that's what happens, I guess. <laughs> You're on the air. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. I'm a letter carrier. And I think that what a lot of people don't realize about the post office is that we have to accept that uh, we can either make a profit in the post office, which means changes, or we can run very high deficits, which means no changes. In fact, we can go back to the day when we delivered to every we, house, irregardless of yeah. what kind of obstacles were in the way. We discussed that at the beginning of the show. If you'd just like to capsulize it, Hugh. Yeah, okay. Thank um, you. I think that what the post office is going to have to do is go to property line delivery. And that means that we wouldn't go off as a public through fare. We would, uh, there would be a box right there, and we would deliver to it. Thank you for your call. That would be blacktop delivery, as you were talking well, about. Well, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier, blacktop delivery. but. You people are talking about towns where you have letter carrier delivery and letter carrier service and parcel service. My concern and the concern of a lot of people are out in rural Canada where we already have to travel and we pay for service, we pay for boxes, and we don't want it destroyed. And we're just telling the Conservative government and Canada Post, you better take a look or you're going to get a fight. Well, I wish we had more time to discuss mm. this. Maybe we can squeeze in just one more call here. We'll go to Vanderhoof. You're on the air. Hello, Helen. Hello. And Happy New Year. Same to you. I don't know whether you remember me or not. It's oh, no, I can't talk like that. You've got to ask a question of my friends here. Okay. What I want to know is uh, the town of Ingen, the people that were running the general store, 
uh, went bankrupt, and Canada Post will not give us an answer as to whether we can get the mail back at the general store here, which is reopened. Okay, we'll get a quick And they answer. won't even let us know whether we can even get these green I'm boxes sorry, or we'll, whatever. We'll have to get a quick answer from Hugh Clark. Thank you for calling from Vanderhoof. I sympathize with you very much, but we've been forced with this for quite some time. I Canada Post, their only excuse and their only reason for destroying a, a rural mail service is that they have to shut an office down at every opportunity they get, and you're one of their opportunities. And I doubt if you'll get your service back if they have their way. I wish we had more time. Thank you both for being on the show today. Good Thank luck. You, you say much. you're going to not give in? No, I'm not. Well, we'll see you in the Supreme Court, I should imagine, someday. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back with Jim Stark and uh, the question of whether or not Canada should be a nuclear weapons-free zone after the break. Welcome. And here is Jim Stark, acting president of a new peace group called Peace 2000. Why acting president, Jim? Well, this is focusing on young people. We're going to try and get them really involved in this issue, and eventually the organization will be turned over to them. So it's a temporary leadership. Well, explain we it to us. It's, it's going to be a, an informal referendum that is not by the government, but by this organization. How is it going to take place? Well, we're planning to have 140,000 people minimum, maybe a lot more than that, with at least two people standing outside every poll in the country at the, on the day of the next federal election. And every person in Canada, every voter will have the uh, occasion to say yes or no to this country finally becoming a nuclear weapons-free zone. Well, here you are in nuclear weapons-free Vancouver and yep. smoke-free Vancouver, I hasten to <laughs> add. And uh, how are you going to go about this? You want students to do this? Who's recruiting them? Well, we've sent a letter out to every uh, high school in the country, every student's council in the country, and now we're waiting to hear back from them. But what we've learned so far is that the young people of this country care a great deal about this issue. They've just never really known what they can do to actually change something. Now the environment is that the Liberal Party, to its great credit, has joined with the New Democratic Party in supporting this goal for Canada. And I think uh, such a profound change in our status is going to need a mandate from the, the whole people, and that's what we're out to get. Isn't there a, a group of young people out there right now going through the high schools? Yeah, they're called SAGE, and the four young people have been traveling across the country. They've started 100 high school peace groups already. And that leaves us about 2,600 to go. <laughs> 2,600. And so the question will be, do you want Canada to be a nuclear weapons-free zone or not? Yeah. Yes or no? That's right. And what if people don't want to vote? Well, they don't have to. They don't have to vote in the election for that matter. But a democracy runs uh, uh, on the majority will of those who vote. Uh, do you think we're seeing a time where students will once again be, have uh, much more to say about the world they live in because they've been rather quiescent for the last 10 years or so? Well, there's been a very quiet process taking place in the schools, Iona. I know that you've noticed it. Teachers are becoming attuned to it. A lot of parents have gone through an awakening in the last 10 years. And these kids care a great deal about this issue. Yes, how widespread is this? And globally, we're seeing students marching in the streets of uh, Beijing, for instance. Uh, is this a global matter? Well, it's hard to say. It could be the beginning of, uh, of a global uh, movement. The uh, Consciousness. The consciousness has changed in the last 10 years. You know, the old Bob Dylan song, The Times, they are changing. They are really changing. Who would have imagined Sakharov, free, speaking out against the Soviet government, speaking out against Star Wars. Who would have imagined the Philippines under Koryo Kino? Well, Sakharov is quite a two-edged sword. I don't think we've seen the edge of, uh, end of that yet. How many nuclear weapons are there in the world now? There's over 50,000 nuclear weapons in this world. It only takes 500 to a couple of thousand to wipe out the whole How planet. many manufactured every day? A net increase of seven or eight nuclear weapons equal to 150 Hiroshima's manufactured How every day. How much is it costing the world, east and west together? Well, the entire arms race is up in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars a year. I mean, that's really too much to fathom, but it's a, it's a thousand, a thousand billion. billion dollars. Yeah. I can't think that high. I don't know. I don't a thousand have that much billion in my dollars. Account. What could we do in that in the world uh, if we could change things? I suppose that's the question. But then the question is, what's going to happen, say, in Vancouver when nuclear weaponed um, 
uh, military or naval vessels come into this port if this is a nuclear weapons-free zone. There's going to be quite a decision to be taken there. Well, you know, Manitoba is a nuclear weapons-free zone. Ontario is a nuclear weapons-free zone. About 300 cities and towns in Canada are nuclear weapons-free zones. But this is all symbolic. We are talking now about the real McCoy. And the next government of this country will probably make this country into a nuclear weapons-free zone. There may be a phased process by which we phase out the visits of nuclear weapons carrying ships, the overflights of nuclear weapons carrying planes, the testing of the cruise missile, other involvements that this we country still has. can't even keep them out of our softwood lim lumber inspections. Uh, how do you go about well, this? you know, part of it is, is facing up to the fact that our foreign policy, as, as you've seen, we've all seen many times, is very heavily influenced by the United States government. We are an independent, sovereign country, and the lunacy of this nuclear weapons situation is such that the time has come for this country to get the hell out. But Jim Stark, it's big business. People are making big money out of it. What are you going to substitute that money with? My goodness, you know, the people who are in charge of defending jobs, the labor unions of this country, are full, four square behind disarmament. They know perfectly well that for every billion dollars spent in arms production, approximately 11,600 jobs are lost lost Iona, the jobs that would exist if that billion dollars were invested in some other area of the economy. Weapons production is bad for the economy, it causes inflation, and it doesn't buy us the security that we're after. That's the worst thing about it. It seems to me the peace groups are all over the map. They can't even get together to have a demonstration without having time allotted to each <laughs> and every one of them and separate discussions about who shall say what and when. You were head of Operation Dismantle. Can you explain for me, do the superpowers in any way undermine peace groups? And if they do, in your experience, how? That's a toughie, Iona, and you know it is. Uh, oh, I don't I ask don't easy <laughs> questions. If Webster was here, to ask you a harder one. Um, <laughs> I think that a government uh, like the Soviet Union that can invade Afghanistan, the government of the United States can overthrow the government of Chile, the government of France can bomb the, uh, the Greenpeace ship in Auckland Harbor in New Zealand. Of course, they're capable of and they are inclined to try and neutralize organizations that are trying to change foreign policy. Whether they are involved in Canadian groups now, I really don't know, but I strongly suspect they are all infiltrated. Whether they are actually trying to subvert these groups is not. By the Russians as well? Probably. And this is part of what's wrong with this world. We have two superpowers who meddle in each other's business and everybody else's business. In fact, if we had a freeze in the nuclear arms race and a start to disarmament, one of the things that should follow shortly thereafter is a non-intervention treaty so that the game could be changed and these two superpowers would just stop sticking their nose into everybody else's business. Well, so you're planning to get at least 140,000 Canadian students activated in this cause and what's going to happen to them if they are infiltrated? What's going to happen to them if, say, some other political power decides to put uh, force and money opposed to them in the field? Well, I rather suspect that's exactly what's going to happen. I think that it's healthy to have a strong no campaign, and there probably will be a strong no campaign. How will it run in the schools, then? Well, each high school will have to mobilize about 8% of its students, and uh, they'll be assigned to a poll, which is an area of about 250 voters. And on election, first they'll do some canvassing before you mean the you're election. You're going to send them from poll, uh, to every door in the poll? Before the election, they'll be going door to door and finding out who's with them, who's against them, who is open to being persuaded, and try and get out every yes vote we can. There'll probably be a no campaign on the other side. You might create a new political party. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, that's certainly not my intent. I don't think so. I think what's going to happen is that the young people are going to be mobilized politically in this country like never before, and a lot of them will <laughs> gravitate to the NDP, to the Liberal Party, and some will gravitate to the Conservative Party. So as party. I see it, you'll have a yes committee and a no committee in every high school mm -hmm. before they go to the referendum and the date of the general election when they'll be asking people to come out and make their vote outside the poll. That's right. This is really a mega project. What the kids in Ottawa are telling us is that we get our 140,000, we're more likely to get a half a million. This is going to be an incredible cultural phenomenon to have people standing outside the polls and taking an issue into their own hands and saying, look, it's time we told the government of this country what we want. So you get 8 or 10 million Canadians saying, we want Canada to be a nuclear weapons-free zone. What do you do with it then? You know, if a government of this country decides to ignore a mandate from its own people that has been so hard fought for, especially by the young, 
they run the risk of alienating, in fact, infuriating an entire generation of youth. I don't think that John Turner or Ed Broadbent or, for that matter, Brian Mulroney would like to take that risk. Well, we're going to ask you for your calls and whether or not you think this man is a hopeless idealist right after the break. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, Jim Stark, are you or are you not a hopeless idealist? Idealist, yes. Hopeless, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's not that long ago when it was considered idealistic to think that women could have the vote. Imagine that. Yeah, it's not that long ago that, that it was considered idealistic to think that slavery could be taken out of the United States. It's not that long ago when it was considered improbable that apartheid could come down. Now it's inevitable. I'll tell you now this country will be a nuclear weapons-free zone in 10 years. It's a question of how. Let's see what the listeners have to say. Go ahead. You're on the air. You ask Mr. Stark whether he knows the geography of Canada. That's not the most relevant question I ever heard, but yes. Uh, you know, you're only a couple of hundred miles away from a place called Hanford at Richland. How would you like to have, God forbid, an accident just a few miles from the Canadian border? Do you think you're going to be able to stop that? any more than the accident that it, 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 it happened. Oh, sorry, Carl. We're talking about weapons. We're not talking about nuclear plants. We're just talking about weapons today. Thank you for your call. We have a long-distance call next. And uh, Sorry, not long-distance. Go ahead, please. Hello, is that me? Yes. Um, I support what Mr. Stark is doing, but um, as a, I, I was a member of the steering committee of the Andy Arms Race about four years ago. And... Um, I kind of, you know, having thought of different strategies, I, uh, I think I would tend to agree more with uh, a suggestion that Dr. Helen Caldicott had, and that's that people occupy the capitals in a peaceful way and just plug up the streets until they do something because we're, we're dealing with people who don't give a damn too much when it comes to... Um, yeah, a peaceful petition outside a polling booth is not a bad idea. You know, I, I think uh, there are many strategies around. Helen Caldicott has some. I had a nice meeting with some representatives of End the Arms Race this afternoon who took uh, quite an interest in this new idea. There's no saying which particular strategy is going to do the job or whether even one strategy will do the job. It'll probably be a combination of many, many different things. What I know is that young people like this idea, and what I know is that w when the people lead, politicians follow. In fact, they usually run right up to the front of the parade and pretend they were leading. Oh, the you sound like a cynic. <laughs> Thank you for your call, sir. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Happy New Year, Iona. Happy New Year. Statement for Mr. Park, or a question, rather. But First of all, in response to your question, uh, is he a hopeless idealist? Well, if he is, so am I. So is uh, a lot of people. Basically, I, I totally agree with the perspective that sees the road to peace through increasing military strength. You know, people say, if, if you'd have peace, prepare for war. It seems to me history clearly shows arms races are followed by war that militarism precedes violent conflict. And I, I would suggest if we want war, prepare for war. But if we want peace, we've got to prepare for peace. Now, you know, the Mr. Saying, Stark, yeah. uh, agree with the, that type of philosophy? Or what is, where is he coming from on this? Yeah, you know, the, the saying, if you want peace, prepare for war, actually comes from Roman times. And it didn't work for them. And I think in the nuclear age, it's very dangerous, if not, if dangerous, if not downright silly, to base our defense strategy on an outdated Roman dictum. What do, you see, what do you see about the response to a nuclear war by building bomb shelters has been recently distributed oh, by our bomb government? Shelters. Well, you know, that's an that old... Seems ludicrous to me. <laughs> Those are clay that, bakers for people. That's an old and very bad joke. A bomb shelter is about the worst place to be in a nuclear war. In fact, the planet Earth is the worst place to be in a nuclear war. They don't, <laughs> they don't do any good. <laughs> Thank you for your call. Moving on long distance, we're going now to Courtney. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'd just like to, to comment that I'm in, in favor of world peace, but I'd also like to ask the, uh, the guest speaker on... How does he feel? We, what kind of position do you think we'd be in today if it wasn't for the nuclear bomb in World War II? And uh, seriously, uh, uh, a thought before you answer this question. I'll hang up and listen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a difficult and it's an honest question. Uh, I think to some extent uh, we have to say that the, the advent of nuclear weapons may have prevented a major northern hemisphere world war in the last 40 years. But we're now faced with a situation where we can destroy the whole world somewhere between 25 and 100 times over. That is patently insane. What we're saying is 
freeze the nuclear arms race, start cutting back the numbers, build up the conventional military if necessary, but mostly find the institutional ways to resolve conflict. This we have to do if we're going to survive the 21st, 22nd, 23rd centuries. In the same manner that we found through democratic government that we could resolve conflicts between individuals, we don't have to wear a six gun anymore, cities don't have to have a standing army anymore, eventually disarmament itself won't lead to peace but it will prepare the way for international law and that is the only long-term pr approach to peace that will work. Thank you. Moving on long distance call, 100 Mile House, you're on the air. Yes, hello? Go ahead. Yes, I have uh, both a comment and two questions. Um, approximately uh, two or so years ago, here in 100 Mile House, there was a uh, local referendum to make 100 Mile a symbolically nuclear-free zone. And it was turned down by the city fathers, etc., etc. And this was mainly because they are so conservative that if, if the thing ever did come up, that they were wishing to transport a nuclear weapon of any sort through our town, that it, it would have been automatically agreed by the city fathers. They would like nothing better. And uh, to, to my, one of my questions, uh, it's to Iona, actually, because I remember hearing several years ago on the radio that you mentioned that it was actually common knowledge that uh, the Canadian Forces Base in Comox, there were small, uh, actually, nuclear devices there in, in the mortar but they were moved out of Canada and I believe it was what year, Jim? That was uh, The last of the nuclear weapons left in 1983, but they were there at one time, yes. Yeah, they were genie rockets and Trudeau, to his credit, I had my differences with the man, but he uh, took the last nuclear weapon out of Canada. And Canada we, is nuclear weapons free right now. We don't have any nuclear weapons stationed here, but we're involved in the nuclear arms race in a number of ways and this is what we want to end. Yes, and um, I was also wondering, since we are so uh, very close to the U.S. border where we have Hanford, as one of your previous callers mentioned, and there's a nuclear trident base at Bangor, a, nu a nuclear submarine base at Bangor in Washington. Um, they're a very close nuclear target. Does it really yeah, matter? I'm trying not to talk about Assuming one of those targets will be struck, Canada would certainly get some of the... Call Look, I'm sir. trying to direct the call to, to military uh, applications of nuclear weapons today away from the issue of, uh, of uh, using uh, nuclear fuel and power. So perhaps the second of the Trident base. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, the problem about talking about if nuclear weapons are used, you know, if we're actually going to have a nuclear war, I don't care if you're in Antarctica, you're going to die from the thing. The proximity of bases is not that relevant. What we are talking about is a new age where this planet is going to get rid of those stupid things once and for all. We have to do that if we're going to survive. We have the choice of either going along with outdated and very dangerous policies based on nuclear weapons or saying this country, like New Zealand, like the Caribbean, like Antarctica for that matter, like other countries, Denmark and Norway both want to become nuclear weapons free zone. Romania, a communist country, is trying to make the Baltic into a nuclear weapons free zone. If we can keep this process going and have Canada play its role, someday our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren can live in a world that's safe, which we'll we don't have We'll try and squeeze now. in one more quick call. Go ahead, please. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, I really don't think it matters one, pardon me, one way or the other whether we're uh, declaring a nuclear free zone or not. I think because of our strategic position to the United States, that there's targets uh, in Canada that uh, should the bombs start falling, that they're going to fall on, in, on Canada anyway. Uh, I really believe until man embraces the Prince of Peace, there is no hope of peace. Thank you for your call. And of course, uh, faith is a good part of it too. Uh, whether one believes in any of the world's uh, universal faiths, they all have the fundamental truth at the base, don't they? Yes, and, and religious people are very much involved in the effort to stop Like the Operation Empire. Plowshares. Like Project Plowshares and all yes. the other organizations. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Jim, for coming on today, and good luck with your new organization. We'll be looking forward to those 140,000 Canadian students, and uh, well, hope, hope you'll come back on the show and well, see Jackson. I hope the young people that watch this show will get after their student council and get that resolution through and get involved. Thank Free you. Free for all after the break, anything you want. Go ahead with your question. 
Well, how about why you're not running she's for gone. prime minister? <laughs> oh, why I didn't run? Uh, because I gave my word I wouldn't, and because I want to make sure that everyone knows that when women say they're going to do something, they do it, and they do it right to the end, and they finish, and they do what, exactly what they said they would do. scandal in three months. Those were his parting words. It's free for all time on Webster. Your choice of subject. First call. Go ahead, please. Hello, Iona. You're on the air. Yes. I was wondering Did if I you could remember you? back about 10 years Can't ago. Can't hear you. Hello? There you are. Yes. I was wondering if you could remember back about 10 years ago or so when Pierre Elliott Trudeau said that door-to-door -door mail service would be a luxury we couldn't afford. Yes, I remember a lot of things he's been saying lately. One of them that the free enterprise system was losing its power and so on. And uh, I think that uh, we have to face the fact that Canada Post can't pay all its bills. Somehow or other, we have to find a compromise. The man we had on today, I believe his real point is that he was not forewarned. He didn't know his property was going to have this. He thought he'd have delivery. But if he had had uh, advance warning that that was a piece of land on which the super box would be put and so on, and if there was some uh, way of assisting a person when they had the super box on their land, I don't think we'd have this issue at all. And I happen to believe Canada Post's going to have to pay its way too. Well, I own a, the, the, there's no fact, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the fact is they are losing money, and the fact that conservatives are trying to do the job of reducing the deficit, I don't think should be. Uh, they should be the whipping boy for it. It well, should have been done many years ago. It's it the way they go about doing it, I think. And they're trying now with the minister coming in with 90-day consultations and so on. They should have started out that way, and they wouldn't have had this public relations disaster. Well, like, it, well, like I say, it, it should have been done many years ago, and the buck was passed on now. And unfortunately, uh, Brian Mulroney, although I don't agree with all the way it's being done, uh, is taking the, uh, the whipping for it. And, uh, but keep in mind, those were fat times for everyone then, and there was enough money then for the post office to survive. They weren't losing money then. Well, thanks for your call. I've got to move on. You're on the air, free for all. Go ahead. Yes, I think your guest there, your last guest, was uh, a little immature in a sense because I'm a veteran of the last war, and I can tell you this, that there would never have been a second great war if the British and the Allies, including the United States, had been well armed. The only reason Hitler attacked anybody was when they were weak. Well, it's the 50th anniversary of the Spanish Civil War, and with there are a lot of people say there would never have been a second war if everyone had gotten together then to fight that battle. However, I don't think we can fight old wars. We've got to look ahead to the future, and the world has changed a very great deal. Well, I'll grant you this, but uh, to, uh, to, set, to, to lay down all your arms, uh, then your, uh, uh, your supposed enemy would just be in a real position. Oh, we're talking multilateral, measured disarmament on all sides. We're not talking unilateral disarmament. The largest, I know, I realize that. The largest standing army in the world is in Russia, and it's posed on the, on the East German border, and uh, they outnumber all the allies, our NATOs. Uh, by a great deal. Well, I don't think they people, don't need a nuclear war. People don't need the mean much in a world where they have the neutron bomb that can kill all human beings and keep the real estate in perfect tact. That's not the kind of world I want to live in, and I'm sure it's not the kind of world you want to live in. No, but I think, gosh, that uh, that uh, we're in the point that we can at least defend ourselves. At least okay, the, uh, I appreciate that point. Thanks for your call. Moving on, you're on the air, free for all. Whoop, got some feedback there. Turn off your television, or you're going to be on very short time. Bye-bye. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, recently you had Dr. Tomorrow on the show, yes. and somebody asked if uh, he would recommend that he teach his child at home. I was surprised at the answer that was given because there are so many factors to consider. You have to consider if the parents are capable and have the ability to teach. Also, you have to consider the quality of the teachers that the child would have got, and I'm surprised that a simple yes was the answer. Of course, he is self-taught himself, and so he, is, he was the guest. He had the right to say what he believed, and he certainly made a success of his life. Perhaps his parents were exceptional. 
I, I agree with that, but I, I think that uh, we cannot make that assumption about everybody else. But let us and do hope that we have a better education system in the future in this province and in Canada than we have now in adjusting to the future. I'm thanking you for your call. I do have to move along free for all. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Hello, Iona. Yes. Yes, I was just wondering if you could explain to me, please, what the difference between equal rights was and women's rights. And if there is no difference, why then did we have the Bill of Rights brought in? Equal rights? Uh, yeah, because women are always complaining about women's rights. And oh, you know how we are. We just can't stand not to be equal. We have to be uh, equal to men, and we have to have equal pay, and we have to have equal rights under the Charter. And we were left without equal rights under the Charter. We were not mentioned because, of course, we are not at a point of equality now. So Section 15 in the Charter takes into account all those peoples in society that, for one reason or another, feel that they are not equally represented at this time. The Charter, 30 or 50 years from now, will be one that will be uh, fully fleshed out and then we we'll, won't have to have those kind of things written in and you'll have what you want, I hope, in the world of the future. So then what you're saying then, there, 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 there are two programs. One is equal rights uh, and the other is rights for women. Not only for women. I mean, after all, in this country until 1958, Indian people couldn't vote. Uh, that we had on the show this week, uh, the gay community asking for equal rights for their uh, literature. We've had all sorts of people pass through this, uh, this set right here asking for equality in this country. We are a pluralistic nation. We go ahead on many fronts at one time, and so we're asking for equality for all facets, not just women. Well, and besides, I, 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 some of us think we're already equal. Yeah, but one, okay, one more point to it then. Uh, a woman can go have an abortion and, and the father of the child has nothing to say about it. So well, if they have a good relationship, they wouldn't have any problem with that. Thank you for your call, sir. You're on the air. Go ahead. Oh, I just called to congratulate Jim Stark on his appearance. Good. Yeah, did you know Jim Stark before when he was oh. in Operation Dismantle? Oh, not at all. I've never, never heard him before at all, but his presentation was remarkably articulate and balanced and yet totally unyielding. Do you have any high school students in your family? I have a, a younger child and a high school student. I see. Well, get them active. Thank you for your call. Free for all time. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Iona, I yes. just wanted to uh, offer an opinion that is not uh, along with Mr. Starks. Um, I, for one, along with I'm sure everyone, would uh, like to see no nuclear weapons on the planet Earth, but to, to try to call ourselves in Canada a nuclear-free zone when in fact uh, it's because we happen to live immediately north of the biggest capitalist democracy that is defending us from those that I'm sure would like to have our property and is doing so with the use of nuclear weapons. I think it's uh, the height of hypocrisy for us to sit here on our fence uh, when we obviously cannot defend ourselves with our own armed forces. Well, let's not forget we're we're the, we are the pig in the middle after all because while south of us we have the U.S., north of us we have you-know-who. Well, I'll be back after the break with some very good news for you. Thank you for your call. And a very special thank you to Jack Webster and to the Webster Show staff. And, and a very special oh, thank you to the, the Webster cup? staff. <laughs> you filled some impossible shoes the last 11 shows, and those thank of us you, who Steve. work in the background wanted to just present you with a little. Well, Thank the inimitable you. Jack is back on Monday, he and he's is. got Pat Carney, That's and she's right. going to have to hold her own on that softwood crisis and issue. This, this is his personal mug, which you can now have. Oh. <laughs> That's all yours. The Webster mug. Okay. See that, Jack? I've got it, and you're back on Monday. Thank you all. And don't forget, at 5 p.m. precisely on Monday, you're going to see quite a confrontation. Pat Carney and Kenneth Dye, the Auditor General. Oh, the Auditor General. Do come back on nice Monday. to see you instead of Webster. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell him you said so. Harry Rankin? No. He says you're going to collapse in a, in a pile of scandal in three months. Those were his parting words. What do you say to that? Those were the nice parting words. <laughs> I've only managed to remember four words that were on the tape. There, I'm sure there were, there were more words, but I can remember four words. And what were they? Well, I, they, I won't well, they press were, you on that. Uh, uh, but, they uh, were you killed your mother. You have all of Jack Webster's audience listening to you now, so do you have any special greetings from you and Amanda and from all your gang? Well, on behalf of myself and the Man in Motion Motor crew and team, 
Uh, we'd just like to uh, thank you for your tremendous support up to date. What's wrong with the educational system? Where is it going to be in You don't have enough years? time. If I was here for a month to tell you what's the matter with <laughs> okay. the educational system. What's it going to be like in 25 years from now? Will schools still exist? Go ahead with your question. Well, how about why you're not oh, running she's for gone. prime minister? <laughs> oh, why I didn't run? Uh, because I gave my word I wouldn't, and because I want to make sure that everyone knows that when women say they're going to do something, they do it, and they do it right to the end, and they finish, and they do what, exactly what they said they would do.